Over two weeks of war in Ukraine, chemical, biological and nuclear weapons are the latest hot topics. But different sides send out conflicting stories. Ukraine is readying itself for the worst. While a Ukrainian diplomat urges the Chinese Communist Party to understand the war will damage far more than just his country. Countries in the Indo-Pacific region chime in on growing defense concerns. New action comes as threats to the region come into clear view. Back in the U.S., activist investors confront the Walt Disney Company over its relationship with Beijing. And for those watching our full episode, popular fast food chains might soon see a setback for their stores in China, all because of a longtime dispute between Beijing and American regulators. Amazon could be tied to forced labor in China. The company is just one of the tech giants facing questions. And did a Chinese warplane crash into the South China Sea? Taiwan says yes, but Beijing is staying silent. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. It's day 16 for the war in Ukraine. Now, people are talking about issues that go beyond the lines of conventional warfare, like chemical, biological and nuclear weapons. Today, the United States accused Russia of spreading disinformation about the war. At a U.N. meeting, a U.S. ambassador denied accusations that U.S. and Ukraine were developing biological weapons and condemned China for supporting Russia's claims. The ambassador called the rumors a Russian attempt to justify using those weapons against Ukraine. Here's more. The United Nations on Friday said it was not aware of any biological weapons program in Ukraine. The U.S. and its allies voiced concerns that Russia was spreading the unproven claim in order to launch its own biological or chemical attacks. Russia called the meeting of the 15-member U.N. Security Council to reassert the accusation that Ukraine ran biological warfare laboratories with U.S. support. Russia asked the Security Council for today's meeting for the sole purpose of lying and spreading disinformation, and that is exactly what you have heard from the Russian PR this morning. The U.S. envoy to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, said Washington is deeply concerned that Russia is accusing the West of the very violations that it plans to use itself. Last month, Secretary Blinken laid out with tragic accuracy what Russia was about to do. He specifically warned that Russia would manufacture a pretext for attack and even cautioned that Russia would fabricate allegations about chemical or biological weapons to justify its own violent attacks against the Ukrainian people. She adds that China has also been spreading disinformation in support of Russia's claims. Chinese state-run media featured headlines such as Russia reveals evidence of U.S.-funded bioprogram in Ukraine and China urges U.S. to disclose more details about biolabs in Ukraine. I will say this once. Ukraine does not have a biological weapons program. There are no Ukrainian biological weapons laboratories supported by the United States, not near Russia's border or anywhere. UN Security Council members rejected Russia's assertions as a lie and utter nonsense. They used the session to amplify accusations that Russia has deliberately targeted and killed hundreds of civilians in its invasion. Is Russia willing to use nuclear weapons? The Ukrainian ambassador to Japan said on Friday that it's possible. We are not going to live in Russian managed state. Full stop. Period. The ambassador said Ukraine's people would put up immense resistance. There is no reason to believe that uh, he will uh, threaten us to the, as he thinks, to the stage that we will overthrow our government and we will embrace Russians after what they have done to us. No way. Therefore, he may use nuclear weapons. Korsansky added that Ukrainian research institutes are ready for the worst and creating a model to estimate what could happen if the Chernobyl and Zaporizhia nuclear power stations are blown up and if there's a nuclear attack. Putin hasn't directly threatened to use nuclear arms. But last month, he ordered Russia's forces on high alert, including nuclear arms. 
He cited what he called aggressive statements by NATO leaders and Western sanctions against Moscow. Ukraine's ambassador to Japan also brought up another issue on the table, the Chinese Communist Party. He called on Beijing to rethink its position on Russia's actions. So you may think about why you spend time on this war criminal when all your major trade partners, all your major market destinations, all your theoretical, probably possible partners in the new world order against it. China and Russia have forged an increasingly close partnership, and China has refused to condemn Russia's attack on Ukraine or call it an invasion. China also refused to join Western countries in sanctioning Moscow. Korsunsky added he hopes the Chinese Communist Party and other major powers in Asia understand that Russia's invasion is a war against humanity. Besides Ukraine's ambassador, another source is shining the spotlight on Chinese policy. This time, the warning comes from Taiwan, as the island's officials urge the Chinese Communist regime not to launch its own war. If the Chinese government miscalculates the situation and takes military action against Taiwan, it will definitely pay a heavy price. Nobody wants a war. It really has to be thoroughly thought over. If you really went to war, it would be disastrous for all. We have had experience during the war of resistance. No matter who wins, it will be a miserable victory. Taiwan's defense minister said Thursday that the island is gearing up and is ready to protect itself. Our army will continue to pay attention to the changes in the situation in Russia and Ukraine and continuously improve the ability of asymmetric warfare, build up people's confidence and boost the morale of our troops. China has been staging military exercises in recent months and flying military planes near the island's airspace. That's including on February 24th, the day Russia began its invasion of Ukraine. Another country in the Indo-Pacific region is set to boost its military. Australia will expand its defense personnel by one-third. The move aims to keep the country safe in what Prime Minister Scott Morrison called an increasingly uncertain global environment. And today I'm announcing that we will boost our defence forces by some 18,500, which will take our defence forces to 80,000 in number. Now this will cost some $38 billion out to 2040. Australian Defence Minister Peter Dutton explained it's critical for Australia to supplement its defence capabilities in order to make it a credible partner with the United States, Britain and NATO. If people think that the ambitions within the Indo-Pacific are restricted just to Taiwan and that there won't be knock-on impacts if we don't provide a deterrence effect and work closely with our colleagues and with our allies, then they don't understand the lessons of history. Last week, leaders of the Quad Alliance discussed the topic. The group, made up of the United States, India, Australia and Japan, agreed that what's happening to Ukraine should not be allowed to happen in the Indo-Pacific. The region's biggest concern at the moment is focused on Taiwan. The Chinese Communist Party claims the self-ruled island as part of mainland Chinese territory and has threatened to take it by force. One of the island's neighbors is also keeping a close eye on Beijing's threat, Japan. Japan is set to increase its national defense budget to new heights. Last month, a key Japanese parliamentarian committee approved the government's record spending plan for the next fiscal year, a whopping $940 billion initial budget. Of that money, nearly $46 billion are earmarked for defense spending. Japan is one of the U.S.'s most important allies in Asia. Japan is a democracy, and it's one of the most technologically advanced nations in Asia. It's also the third largest economy worldwide, after the U.S. and China. The southernmost Japanese islands are only 100-plus miles from Taiwan, meaning if Taiwan comes under attack from Beijing, war would rage just miles from Japan's doorstep. Disney was confronted by two activist investors during its annual shareholder meeting over the company's relationship with China and its race-based employee training. Here's more. National Legal Policy Center wants to know what Disney is actually doing in conducting its business with China and other countries with poor human rights protections. But all the Disney board has to say for itself is that our proposal is a waste of their time 
that they don't have enough resources to carry it out. Activist shareholders have confronted Disney over doing business in China and race-based employee training. Paul Chesser is a director at the National Legal and Policy Center, a Disney shareholder. We wanted to present a human rights uh, uh, focused resolution uh, asking the company to deliver a report on an annual basis that uh, uh, requires them to disclose all their interactions with foreign governments. We use China as our obvious uh, focus. Chesser specifically cites the filming of Mulan in the Xinjiang region, where the Chinese Communist Party is persecuting Uyghurs, a Turkic ethnic group native to Xinjiang. To what degree there was slave labor or anything nefarious um, going on up there and whatever cooperation was done, Disney keeps it and all they did was thank the local government. And that's highly inappropriate because they're the ones of enforcing these, these uh, human rights atrocities in, in, uh, in that region of the country. Disney's board recommended everyone vote against the proposal, saying that it rests on a misplaced premise and is neither a necessary nor productive use of the company's resources. The resolution ultimately lost. Meanwhile, another shareholder made a proposal regarding race-based employee training. Critical race theory, or CRT, debases human existence by reducing it to a singular element that no one can control, their skin tone. Stop subjecting your employees to racist and Marxist training. The National Center for Public Policy Research proposed that Disney perform an audit of its anti-racism training. One of the names of the programs was called Reimagining Tomorrow, and they had employees of theirs do a 21-day reflection on on how they participated in white culture and um, all kinds of white guilt uh, programs based in critical race theory, similar to what you see in schools. Ethan Peck is an associate at the National Center for Public Policy Research. Peck says they want Disney to see what impact this training has on the employees. The board says the proposal mischaracterizes the company's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and shareholders ultimately rejected it. Bay Quarter, NTV News. And that's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We are now sharing a shortened version of our program on YouTube. That's after being demonetized for a year. Full episodes can be watched on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up for a 14-day free trial, please click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer, and see you tomorrow. Every once in a while, something comes along so masterful, it leaves you in awe. So inspiring, it changes your life. So beautiful, you wish it would never end. When that happens, it's something not to be missed. Shen Yun, an all new production every year. The performance was enchanting. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted. It touches you. It really does. The expertise of the dancers was really, really strong. To know that it was live music was really fantastic. We didn't want to miss this. Make sure you see it. Have to come. Life-changing.